gives me great pleasure to extend to you all a very warm welcome to our fourth annual UK CFA IVF Symposium here in Cyprus. Thank you for coming. Myself and my team are all delighted that you are here. I would like to extend a special thank you to Mr. Tony Rutherford, uh, Ms. Claire England, Ms. Rachel Cutting, and Mr. Gazvani, who for dedicating their time and effort into making this symposium possible and successful. This conference gives us the opportunity to show you what we do and exchange ideas. Our new clinic has been going from strength to strength. I hope you enjoy your stay in Cyprus and enjoy the symposium. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, um, echo um, Hebo's welcome to Northern Cyprus for the fourth symposium here. Um, it's a real great pleasure to come here in the sunshine, and uh, at least this year we've got sunshine. It's a real pleasure and a real honour to be here with um, so many friendly faces, and I'm sure we're going to have a good couple of sessions. Um, the first speaker this afternoon needs no introduction, I'm sure, to many of us here. And if anybody saw Roy this morning, he had a, a t-shirt which said that everybody in the north of England were right and everybody in the south were wrong. So I'm sure his talk about the future of IVF is going to be spot on and completely accurate. <laughs> okay, so I'll hand over to Roy. All of this meeting is down to the kind generosity of Ibo Teki and Gazi as well. So I think we all ought to put our hands together and thank them um, for that kind generosity allowing us to come together like this. I am going to start uh, the symposium in a funny way because usually future perspectives come at the end. So this time we're going to start and uh, try and look forward to where we're going to be in 10 years' time. Now, IVF started, as you know, in 1978. And this is a photograph of me in 1978. <laughs> and just to show you how much things have changed since then, that's me today. <laughs> So it's not just IVF and reproduction that's, uh, that's changed, I think everything else has. But still, what we're going to do, as I said, is uh, look ahead into a crystal ball and see if we can predict where we're going to be in 10 years' time. Well, first of all, we're going to need much more IVF because sexual intercourse is going out of fashion. This was published in The Lancet, it's the National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles and you can see an amazing difference in these three periods of time. Presentation of the uh, first session. Um, this is a um, talk by Mr. Ali Metten, who's a consultant gynecological oncologist in uh, Gateshead. And the title of his talk is uh, Fertility Sparing Surgery for Survival Cancer. And in the, in the past, uh, I went to medical school in, uh, in Istanbul, uh, but I never worked there. I've been, work, been living in the UK for about 19 years. Um, this, is, this is where I am at the moment, in Gateshead, uh, where Isaac and, and Ian is from as well. We work together. This is um, one side of the river is Newcastle. This side, and then the other side is Gateshead, where we'll be hosting the, the National Gynae Oncology Meeting, BGCS, in July. You're all welcome to attend. It will be a great meeting in association with Greek and Turkish societies of gynae oncology. And also, we do yearly laparoscopic cadaver course if anybody's interested. Uh, I don't want to bore you with the uh, details of oncology, but would like to. Um, give you some information regarding the fertility sparing techniques in early cervical cancer and show some operation videos uh, if you have time. As you know, the classic treatment of cervical cancer is radical hysterectomy. 
which is not participating surgery. And uh, this man, Daniel Darjan, in 1994, described vaginal trachelectomy, which has been very popular. Ben Ali Küçükmet'in e, İngiltere'de Newcastle'da jinekolog kontrol olarak çalışmaktayım. Jinekolojik kanserlerde e, özellikle laparoskopik kapalı yöntemle ameliyatlarında uzmanlaşmış durumdayım. İngiltere'de kapalı yöntemle rahim ağzı kanserinde trakelektomi denen, denen bir yöntemi ilk kez uyguladı 2011 yılında. Onu devam, onun devamında e, değişik konuları, değişik ameliyat teknikleriyle gerek ilk e, teşhis edildiğinde serbest kanserlerinde ve onun yükselen durumlarında değişik tedavi yöntemlerini uygulamaktayız. Çalıştığım e, merkez Northern Gynecological Oncology Center, Gateshead'de İngiltere'nin e, en iyi merkezlerinden bir tanesidir. Efendim bu video gösterisi yaptınız, e, robotik e, aletlerle ameliyat yaptınız. Biraz bahseder misiniz? Şimdi gösterdiğim yöntem e, kapalı yöntemle, laparoskopik ve robotik yöntemle, kapalı yöntemle hastaya büyük kesi vermeden yapılan e, ameliyat yöntemleridir. Bunlar kompleks e, yani zor kanser vakalarında e, kullanılan yöntemler. Hastanın ameliyat sonrası iyileşmesini ve eve gidiş süresini kısaltan yöntemler olduğu için e, sıkça uygulanmaya başlanan ve popülaritesini kazanan yöntemler. Ve bu konuda bizim eğitim e, programlarımız da var. Yılda bir kere kadavra üzerinde eğitim programı uyguluyoruz. Ve İngiltere'nin ve dünyanın değişik yöllerinden insanlar e, bu eğitim programlarına geliyorlar. Ben de işte gerek Türkiye olsun, gerek Yunanistan değişik yerlerde canlı ameliyatlar da yaparak e, bu yöntemleri öğretiyorum. Ne kadar şey, çok doktor öğretirsek o kadar hasta e, bu yeni yöntemlerden faydalanmış olur. Bu yani, tele sonra. Robotlara ihtiyaç olacak o zaman yakın bir zamanda. E, robotlar evet e, şu anda da kullanılıyor zaten. Robotun hastadan şu anda hastadan daha çok cerrah faydası olduğu için Yaygın durumda değil İngiltere'de ama bazı merkezlerde kullanılıyor çünkü bunun masrafı bayağı pahalı yani 2 bin, 2 milyon puan falan geliyor robotun ama laparoskopinin bir aşaması olarak e, yani ilerleyen zamanlara daha çok kullanılacaktır. Bu ameliyatlar e, iyi geçtiği durumlarda hastalar tedavi olduğu zamanlarda sonra hamile kalma olasılıkları oluyor mu? Evet, evet. O tabii ki şimdi serbest kanseri daha çok genç hastalar etkilediği için yani bunların birçoğu çocuk sahibi olmamış durumda. Çocuk sahibi olacak olmak istedikleri için bu yöntem kullanılıyor. Yani rahim ağzı alıp ama rahimin kendisi korunarak. Tabii bazı riskler olmakla beraber çocuk doğurma şansını taradığı için hastaları popüler bir durumda. O yüzden de işte bu konferansta infertilite uzmanlarına e, bu konuşmayı yaptım. Onları bilgilendirdim bu konuda. İngiltere'de bugüne kadar kaç ameliyata girdiniz acaba? İngiltere'de yak 20 yıldır yaklaşık İngiltere'de çalışıyorum. E, yani binlerce ameliyat yaptım orada. E, kanser ameliyatları da yani doğru, kanser olmayan ameliyatları da yapıyorum. Yani Siz cerrah sayısını, sunur bu zaman değil mi? Tabii aslında? cerrahım ben. Yani. Kanakoloji. Jinekolojik, onkoloji cerrahi. Yani eğitim 16 sene sürdü benim eğitimi tamamlamam. Çünkü Glasgow'da sizden başka cerrah var mı? Newcastle'da. Newcastle'da benden başka cerrah var. Newcastle 5 e, kişi beraber çalışıyoruz. Ama hepimiz değişik yönlerde uzmanlaşıyoruz. E, yani benim daha çok kapalı yöntemlerle onu geliştirdim ben. Ve bizim, bizim merkezimiz yani hem açık olsun hem kapalı olsun İngiltere'nin en büyük merkezlerinden bir tanesi. Tabii ki çok <gülüyor> çok teşekkür ederiz. Abi, ben teşekkür ederim. And those are the things that I'm going to come back to in terms of how they impact reproductive function. 
If we look at physical activity levels in the, in the UK generally, and this is objectively measured, this isn't people reporting physical activity, because as you all know, people will over-report what they do. This is accelerometry, accelerometry data from the, um, the household survey in 2008, so this is objective measurements. And what you'll see is that although people say they exercise, if you look here, here's our age groups for men and women, and we're looking at these bottom bars here. These, this is the percentage of people in those age categories that reach the recommended guidelines of 30 minutes per day. Um, I've now moved to Tamworth. Tamworth has two important buildings. The first is Tamworth Castle, which is a thousand years old, and the other is the New Middle Fertility, which is one year old. Um, Tamworth is the obesity capital of England, so it might be quite <laughs> relevant to what we've been talking about. Talking about the immune system, to say there is no benefit, because if we do have evidence, although it's not from great trials, and they're not randomised prospective controlled trials, but we do have evidence that these treatments can modify aspects of the immune system that are important in infantation. And I take Charles' point about a randomised controlled trial, but that's going to be very difficult to do. So, it's when you get when you get those. At, the, I, I agree. It's only it's only rare. But when you get those those um, cases of, of actual harm, and there's only, it's, it's going to happen. Some patient somewhere is going to have recurrent implantation failure if you believe that diagnosis, and we give her prednisolone, and she is going to get a complication of prednisolone, and that is in the absence of any evidence. Okay, I think we better sort of make make a start. We're already uh, running a little bit behind schedule. We'll, we'll try and. Make up as we go along. Um, welcome to day two of the uh, Cyprus uh, Symposium. I thought we all had a very pleasant day doing what have you been doing, visiting the clinic or visiting other areas of interest. Marching powder, tombstones, snow, rocks, Percy Pebbles, Free Base, Charlie, Chan, Superman, Rolexes, Mitsubishi's, Dolphin. This topic um, and the organising committee for arranging the conference and echo Chris's words about the excellent hospitality from everyone. Um, so I'd like to just go through um, in the next 15-20 minutes about why it's important for um, us working in the UK, uh, indeed in the Turkish Republic of North Cyprus and elsewhere, to know about different perspectives of patients uh, on their treatment. So I'm going to focus on UK Muslims. So time-lapse options. So there's currently three main time-lapse options available um, for us. And um, th the first one there is the embryo scope, which is a built-in time-lapse system within a, an incubator itself. Um, like the other speakers, I'd like to thank the organisers for the invitation and their persistent invitation because I think this is the third year they've asked me to come and I never was able, my diary didn't allow it. And I was hearing all kinds of stories and rumours about this meeting so I wanted to come and it's nice to come and um, find out what it's all about tonight. The um, last few minutes is just to go through with you um, the true cost of egg donation both here, um, uh, so abroad and at home in the UK. What I thought I'd do is um, to, to compare to Cyprus, we, I've worked with Cyprus with, for seven years now, between six and seven years, and we've built up a really nice process of how it works from clinician to patient. And I thought, well, what I'll do is I'm going to ring and contact other clinics and just see what I get answers to, to the questions I, I get asked. So I asked what information I've received about the donor, Will the donor be exclusive? Will I get all the eggs or will it be shared? 